Ladies and gentlemen, we now start our last session for today and look at China Middle East trade. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Dr. Linda Marta. You have the floor. I'm delighted to chair the last panel for today, which de deals with China Middle East trade, country case studies. As we have figured out from uh, the earlier discussions and uh, presentations that the China Middle East relations are as old as the two ancient civilizations and the relations are so diverse between the two that they range from economic and commercial to political and financial as well as to cultural ties and cooperation. With that in mind, I look, we look forward to hearing from our esteemed speakers who will share with us their work and views in relation to China Middle East relations as well as the re recent petrochemical development in the GCC. I'd like to welcome our first speaker to the, in this panel, Mr. Mutlak al Murshid, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Tasnia, one of the largest Saudi diversified industrial companies with investment in several fields. His presentation is on petrochemical industry in the GCC. May I pass the floor mm -hmm. to you, Mr. Al Murshid? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. Coming from a visit to Canada two weeks ago at Edmonton, where the temperature was minus 30, to a temperature of plus 30 is quite good. <laughs> of course, being from Saudi Arabia, we're used to the heat, so it's okay. We can handle the heat. This is pleasant for us. It's not so hot. Temperature in Riyadh sometimes can reach 50 degrees, so that's fine. Uh, Singapore is a great place. Uh, I've been here many times. I was involved in opening the SABIC office here of long, 25 years ago, which a company I was the chief financial officer, the third largest chemical company in the world. Now change companies, of course, but at that time, uh, Singapore was a different place 25 years ago. But due to your excellent infrastructure and excellent tax regime, uh, SABIC at that time decided to open its uh, agent headquarters here in the city of Singapore which was a, really a compliment because SABIC has lots of choices. It's a huge operation, was like over $15 billion of operation in this part of the world. I mean, China, Asia, all of it together. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, really thank the Middle East Institute for asking me to talk to you today. I'm afraid this presentation is not going to be your typical geopolitical or controversial politics or anything. It's just a typical business as usual presentation, talking mainly about the chemical industry, uh, where we in Saudi Arabia specifically and the GCC in general have quite a strong position in that industry and do a lot of business actually uh, here in Asia. The other things for me being an Arab, it's nice to be in Singapore. There is a lot of the names I can read without a problem. Being of an Arabic names, let it be streets or shops or souks or whatever. So it's quite, in, quite nice to have that kind of feeling. And you can walk around and you can see a few mosques. So it's quite nice. It reminds me of home. So with that, I would like to uh, basically start with an overview of the chemical industry. I'm aware it's uh, last session, so people are tired. So I promise not to go over time. So I'll keep it. Uh, I will cover first a general view of the industry, so we'll give you a flavor. The industry actually started long time. Actually, first wave was the Germans, started by basically scientists, was developed when the Haberbosch invented the ammonia process, technologies or you know, process, which produced ammonia, which was in a way needed for ammunition for World War I and fertilizers later on. So that was significant. In the 1920s, uh, Fischer Tropsch developed the gasification process, which is widely used in China, mainland China, widely used. Uh, unfortunately, for that process, it produced a lot of CO2, which nature took millions of years to take CO2 basically into solid carbon through trees and so on. And unfortunately, this process does turn it into back to CO2, although this process was developed under war, so it was needed for the German. Uh, rubber and so on industry, so it has a different history related to it. Then came the Fischer-Nata catalyst, which basically 
enable the plastic industry as we know it today. So polymerization was developed for polyethylene, polypropylene, and as you can see around you in this room or in your car, it's full of that stuff. So that's the whole thing. Then from there, uh, President Reagan, bless his soul, uh, did the deregulation in the US industry that actually created a huge uh, revolution of chemical plant buildup, especially along Gulf Coast in places like Houston and Louisiana, that big expansion. Even today, most of the US industry is gas-based, although there is some liquid. When I say gas-based, it's mainly uh, methane, ethane. We call it in our lingo C1, C2 chemistry. And then later on, we switched to heavy, NAFTA, and so on, because the gas was not available. Then the shale gas revolution came in, went back to that kind of its basis. Third wave of the chemical industry was actually created by Saudi Arabia back in the late 70s, early 80s. The government of Saudi introduced the master gas gathering system. Before that, huge amount of gas was flared. If I was a kid in Dammam, uh, you could read and do your homework on the light of the flares. There is amount of gas, huge amount of gas being flared. Government collected that, then here comes the new wave of the chemical industry around you know, the 90s, late 80s, 90s, 2000s. So that reached, and now we're getting into another wave with US back into the shale gas and China into uh, coal to chemical, although I will cover coal to chemical. It's a little bit problematic. If you see what happened today, the size of the industry, as industry today is like a $4 trillion industry, so it's quite huge industry. Anywhere you can see around you is there is some chemistry in it, including our own bodies. So wherever you go, there is chemistry somewhere. And uh, you can see that the industry growth has been significant. You see the latest course up to 17, huge growth in China, huge growth in uh, GCC, rest of Asia. Latin America to a certain extent, but the now, from now on, you'll see another wave coming in North America, both in the US and to a certain extent in Canada, where you see the impact of shale gas. So it's an industry four trillion, and it's going almost another two extra six trillion, in another five, seven years, you will see a six trillion mark. If you look at the GCC share of the chemical industry globally, we have quite a large, really for a small, part of the world population-wise, uh, area-wise, quite big, but it's mostly desert, so, but luckily for us, that desert is useful because it has oil under it. <laughs> so that's, that's a bonus, like they say. So it's a big industry, it's an 84 billion uh, industry in, 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 at our, uh, you know, in, the, in the economy, in the revenue. It, by far, it's Saudi Arabia is the large gorilla in the room. So it's, it's the big player in the industry creating 78%. Saudi Arabia alone make over almost 100 million ton of chemicals, surpassing lots of countries, including Japan and others. So it's a quite a big industry in our region. Uh, if you look at the Middle East and gas, we're quite big. This does not include shale gas, which is just starting in places like Saudi Arabia. So I won't be surprised if this picture will change in the next five years or so. So this is basically conventional gas, meaning no fracking. Somebody was mentioned the word fracking earlier. This is mostly conventional. The old way you drill a hole and, and you get gas, or in case of Saudi Arabia, gas comes with oil. So really, oil companies are looking for oil. Just gas happens to be with it, which is a freebie, basically. So that's, that's the game. Uh, if you look at the price of gas, Middle East by far, from 2004 and before, no competition. Gas in Saudi was $0.5 per million BTU, simply because the oil companies make all the money in oil. So actually, they thank the people who take the gas, otherwise they'll be flaring, and with the government master gas gathering system, forbid flaring, so oil companies said, come and take it. You know, we, we don't want to deal with it. And even today, if you go to Canada, where I was, actually in some place in Canada, they pay you to take the gas. Because that's fair, the name of the game is the oil. They want to take the oil, and they do, cannot flare also by the Canadian law, so they'll be happy to pay somebody to take the gas. And that's what I am being the somebody who would like to take the gas in Edmonton. 
So you see the, <clears throat> the things going on up on the left hand side. There was an uplift back in uh, around, so gas today went from 50 up to 95 in Saudi, I mean 50 cents a million BTU, then went to 0.75 dollar or 75 cents a million BTU, around 95, then recently about the beginning of between 15, 16, went to uh, 1.5 for C1, ethane, and 1.75 uh, dollar per million BTU for ethane, so methane and ethane. And the right hand is the price of propane. Saudi propane is ratioed to NAFTA in Singapore used to be many years, many years is gone with that. 80% of propane price equivalent to 80% of the NAFTA. And you see sometimes our price actually overshoots the US, but purely after when the shale gas came into play. Before that, always propane in, in the Arabian Gulf, which Saudi Arabia and the Emirates are the big player of the game. Uh, was always below the US. We now in the ethane, if you look at Mount Bellevue, Mount Bellevue sometimes goes to two or three things. We are in the 1.75, so there's still, but the US has the advantage of having the market. Uh, we don't have the market. We are an export-oriented industry in the Middle East or the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia in particular. So we have to ship over long lanes. Our friends, our competitors in the US, they have the market at home. So that's quite convenient. And now with the shale gas, they're actually exporting. So when they export, of course, they're gonna run the same problem we exporters have. You know, you run to taxes, you run to things. Luckily for the Americans, they have the agreement with the EU, they don't pay taxes. We pay 6.5% into the EU to enter the EU. We don't have bilateral agreements. Unfortunately, one of the speakers was talking about China's GCC agreement. Unfortunately, we business people don't like it. But unfortunately, it's not our choice. Those politicians have not agreed, so we pay taxes. The American, of course, when they come to Asia, they pay some taxes, but in Europe, they don't pay taxes, and they prefer Europe. So the competition is at height between the Gulf producers and the Americans are actually in Europe, especially the American producers on uh, the Atlantic side, like in Pennsylvania and to a certain extent back to the south, Houston and Texas, and Louisiana. So these are what's happening at the moment. If we look at the added value, I don't, I don't want to spend so much time because I know the time, so just I want to highlight the bottom line of the weighted uh, EBITDA. You see, basically, in this industry, if you go to the feedstock, it's 74 billion, drops to 31 billion, 12 billion, a total of 127 billion, which is the GCC, mostly from Saudi Arabia. But basically, the name of the game, money is made upstream. That's it. You, where you go farther upstream, you make the money. The more you go down, you get start very tough. Because in the chemical industry, as a company, I only come to your country for two things. No political, no religion, no color, nothing. I want either feedstock, that country has a feedstock to provide at a competitive price, or I want market that I can sell. You know, if you look at the situation around the world, in Asia, you have the market, you have the financial to a certain extent technologies, unfortunately, you don't have the feedstock in general. If you go to Europe, similar things. You have money, you have technology, blah, 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 but you don't have the feedstock. Middle East relies heavily in the beginning on American slash European technologies. Now it's developing its own, but it has the you know, financial, it has the feedstock, but it doesn't have the market. You go to, America is the only exception. The Americans are lucky, our friends there. They have the market, they have the technology, and so on, and they have the feedstock with the shale gas. So that's what makes the American competitors, they are very formidable. So anyway, what I'm just saying, money is made upstream. If you apply that to oil, by the way, oil refineries, I used to work in a refinery in Houston, Texas, many years ago. Refinery don't make money. It's just the oil company's way to get the crude oil from the field to the gas station. And they just have, they'll be happy to give the refinery to anybody, but they have, they're stuck with it. The money made in the gas field. Same with iron ore, same with aluminum, anywhere. Money tends to be on that left side of the things. Uh, if you look at the late 90s, the GCC regulators really started the industry. The gas project in Saudi Arabia, clear regulation in the countries like Saudi Arabia itself. 
The development of industrial cities like Jubail and Yambo, it's nice, actually. I worked in the US, I worked in Europe. Uh, most of the industry developed historically in some close to town, some even very close to town, and grew and houses and so on. In Saudi Arabia, it was nice. You have a piece of the desert. As an engineer, it's a dream. You put your map, you do the thing, do everything. Here comes houses, here come whatever, here come port, here come the industry. And you always put the houses upstream wind, so if any smell doesn't go to the houses. But if you're in Europe or America, with all the established industry, you don't have that luxury. And that's why the Gulf, especially Saudi industry, grew as mega. We were the first people to build the crackers exceeding a uh, million ton. At that time, nobody heard of an ethylene cracker going over a million ton. Today, of course, there are 1.6 or so. So I'm getting a message, so sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna talk a little bit quick. So if you look at the regulators in the GCC, again, they develop this thing. Now they're pushing for the liquid side. When you crack uh, lights like C1, C2, C1 mostly goes into uh, methanol or uh, urea production. And C2 goes in ethylene, but you, the downstream derivative is very light end, we call it in our lingo. So you have to go farther down in the C1, C2, C4, C5, 6, and so on to produce the butadiene and other stuff. And so regulator now they're pushing that. If you look at the, you know, the specialties, specialties, success is where you are in the market. If you're gonna, you know, Sabicor, I used to work, sold basically every iPhone in your pocket, every piece of plastic in it is made by Sabicor. You can do that by having facilities, not the resin itself, but having the facility of conversion in China. That's where the stuff is made. But the raw material doesn't come from China, it comes from US or Saudi Arabia, where Sabic plants are located. So that's the kind of gain. In the upstream business, you put your chemical plant where the feed stock. In downstream, you put it where the market. Uh, and you can see, the, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. So what happened over the years with the gas being less and availability in the Middle East and the Gulf countries, especially Saudi Arabia, all the players of Sabic, Adnak, and so on, they moved outside. Sabic bought GE Plastic, 2007, bought, Sabic, bought um, DSM Chemical in Europe, and so on. And the Qataris did some, and the Emirati did some. So you see a huge jump that were the Gulf producers actually now more producing a lot in Europe and North America and in Asia. Sabic has huge facilities in China. Tasnir, my company, has some facilities in China. So everybody is going also. So if you chemical, you know, for the jobs, unfortunately, the chemical industry is capital intensive, but not labor intensive. So it's a big, in the GDP picture, we do like 6% or so of the Gulf countries. But unfortunately, in the labor side, we're less. You know, it's not like the automotive or the steel or aluminum or something. That's the nature of it. But it's a huge added value. It pays high benefit, high salaries. So it's a very nice industry to have for any country. But you have to have the stuff to have it, you know, to take it in your country. Uh, in summary, as being pushed for time, an apology again to move quickly. Uh, the GCC player are now facing a number of challenges. One of them, the competition with our friends, the Americans, uh, because of the shale gas situation and the American bilateral agreement and tax treaties with different countries around the world, which unfortunately in the GCC we don't have. Like I said, Europe, we pay six and a half. American and Europe pay zero. So that's an advantage. The competition from uh, coal to chemical coming from China, but that's, in my opinion, is, is limited because you're going against the law of physics what took nature millions of years to turn into carbon, you're gonna just do it in a split second back to the air and produce a lot of ash and so on. So for a while it's okay, fine. Uh, but after a while, I think even the Chinese now are slowing down significantly because they need to breathe. You cannot put full the air with the stuff. So, and then that's happened. And then now in the Middle East, the big one, or at least for the GC, is the limited, limited of availability of feedstock. So the next step for us actually, and we've been lobbying our governments, is to price NAFTA, which we export lots of it around the world into attractive price so crackers can be made to crack NAFTA rather than gas. And that will, will actually create another huge wave of petrochemical expansion, both in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries. And I'm sure that will come at the moment. There's some kind of talk, but sooner or later that has to happen. 
and you will see a huge expansion of that industry. So I do not take so much of your time. Unfortunately, we're running out. Thank you so much for listening and pleasure with everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Al Murshid, for this interesting insight about the challenges of the petrochemical industry in the GCC. I am pleased now to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Altai Atli, uh, who is a lecturer at the Department of International Relations, Koch University, Istanbul. And the title of his presentation is Turkey's View on, of China as an Economic Partner. May I welcome you, Dr. Atli? Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, a big thank you to uh, Professor Ho and the whole staff of Middle East Institute for having me here. It's always a pleasure to be uh, in Singapore and in NUS. So I'll be talking about how Turkey approaches uh, China as an economy, as a partner in economic relations. And uh, yes, so all right, okay. So there's. Probably there have been some problem with because these weren't the colors I chosen. But anyway, so uh, the information is there, is right. So uh, uh, something has shifted, but uh, nevertheless, okay, all right. Uh, Turkey's view of uh, China as an economic partner. So when we talk about this, the first thing that uh, comes uh, to the foreground when we talk about Turkey's economic relations with China is, of course, this and. Again, I apologize because something has probably shifted because I switched from Mac to PC and I had to convert from Keynote to PowerPoint. So this is a bit unexpected, but anyway, you have the information here. So there is a big uh, and widening uh, here uh, trade deficit. Up there you see the Turkish imports from China and down there you see the uh, Turkish exports. So this is there is a trade deficit. Turkey's trade with China is increasing and so does uh, its trade deficit and it's a big problem actually because Turkey has a current account deficit, it's a big problem for the Turkish economy and uh, well, you know, Turkish current account deficit is around 40 billion dollars uh, recently and uh, Turkish trade deficit with uh, China is almost half of it, so problem. But then again, uh, if you look at the investment side, it's growing, but it's still at the early stages. Turkish investment in China, Turkish FDI in China is around more than uh, 200 million. Uh, but uh, here, uh, Chinese FDI in Turkey is more than 1.5 billion. It's much more than that. Uh, it's much more compared to Turkish investment in China. These figures are actually probably higher because I have taken them from the central bank and central bank, uh, well, they uh, provide the officially registered capital flows. They don't include the retained earnings, reinvested earnings or investments through third countries, but it gives you an idea. And some of the uh, larger corporations of uh, China have already invested uh, in Turkey, including Huawei, including two banks, including Alibaba. Okay, so given this picture, how do the Turks, how do the Turkish government, how, do the Tur how does the Turkish government, how does the Turkish business community approach uh, relations uh, China as an economic partner? I have some quotes here, one uh, from the Minister of Trade, which says, basically, I'm not going to read them all, but basically they are saying, we have this trade deficit, so we have to get uh, more investment from China to establish a balance. Uh, a diplomat from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, whom I interviewed myself, he says, well, we have to do everything that we can because that's a must. We have to get more investment from China. So Turkey is making efforts to have a more balanced economic relationship with China. And uh, here's, uh, uh, there's a move from the rhetoric, uh, a rhetoric that has been going on for many years. So it was always about how do we close the trade deficit. But as we said that, uh, you know, I was myself included uh, in some negotiations years ago in between Turkey and China. So we were going to Beijing, meeting with Mofcom and telling them, so you should buy more from us because we have to close this deficit. Now this is changing to, okay, we can live with the deficit, but we need to get more investment from China. 
uh, yes, and you can see this also in the recent, uh, I mean, the government's approach in the uh, recent action plans issued by the Turkish government. For example, Minister of Trade has designated China as a, may, uh, as a priority market. Uh, there is uh, also an item about uh, facilitating the use of uh, local currencies uh, between Turkey and China instead of dollar or euro. Uh, Minister of Treasury targeting Chinese financial market in order to achieve greater diversification in partners and uh, instruments of external borrowing. So we are borrowing money. Turkey depends on external funding. So why not getting more from China and uh, getting more tourists? Okay, so here comes the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, into the picture. So Turkey, well, the geography tells us, maps do tell us uh, that Turkey has a very uh, important position along the route of the BRI, and Turkey wants to capitalize uh, on this. And uh, in this sense, BRI is seen as a tool for facilitating investment uh, from China. Again, some quotes, President Erdogan, uh, well, he is saying that Turkey matters a lot for this, uh, for this project. And also a representative from the business community, uh, the chairperson of the largest business association of Turkey. Uh, he says, she says, uh, we are between China, Central Asia and Caspian and Europe. So, and Turkey offers, we do offer the shortest and the most feasible route here. The focus, the Turkish focus here is on the development of infrastructure, physical infrastructure and mainly uh, transportation and logistics infrastructure. And this is also very important for Turkey's uh, long term sustainable economic development as well, because Turkey does uh, have an, uh, you know, a gap in infrastructure investments uh, too. So Turkish investment infrastructure industry is growing. And if you look at the transportation infrastructure here, it's more about railroads. It's more about increasing the share of railroad transportation in both cargo and passenger. And uh, the aim is uh, to increase the total length of Turkish railroads from 12,000 to 35,000 by the year 2035. And uh, well, that requires, of course, uh, some funding. 45 billion worth of investment is uh, needed here. So, uh, okay, so why not working with China, uh, given the uh, focus within the BRI itself uh, on the railroad connectivity? So why not working with China? Well, China is already a player in the Turkish railway sector. They have done parts of the Ankara-Istanbul uh, railway line and also other parts, other segments. And uh, there's also growing interest uh, from the Chinese side. And it's not just interest. There are actually uh, agreements uh, signed between the two parties, like, uh, like memoranda of understanding on, for example, the Kars Edirne Railroad, which is a $35 billion project. This is connecting Turkey's easternmost point, Kars, on the Armenian border with Edirne on the westernmost point of Turkey, uh, connecting uh, you know, Turkey's border with uh, Greece and Bulgaria. So this will span the entire length of Turkey. And uh, there is the interest. There are the first steps uh, taken. There are already some uh, outcomes on the ground. And uh, there is also the legislative framework being completed. Two agreements signed between Turkey and China. Uh, one on aligning the Silk Road, uh, aligning the BRI with uh, Turkey's Middle Corridor project, which aims to connect Turkey through the Caspian uh, to Central Asia with uh, Baku-Tbilisi-Kars uh, railway, which was which started operations last last year at its heart. So actually, it's, I, I see it actually like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. So you bring the pieces of puzzle together, like Baku Tbilisi cars was one piece, now cars Edirne another piece, the ports other piece, and you get the whole picture uh, of the BRI here. Uh, also, uh, another agreement, railway uh, cooperation and land transpo transportation. It's not only about railroads or land transportation, it's actually about intermodal, uh, inter combined uh, transportation. Well, because you, have to, you need the combination of different modes of transportation to get your goods from you know, China to Europe or from point A to point B. So Kumport Istam near Istanbul is uh, one of the largest container terminals uh, in uh, Turkey. And this is also the largest uh, Chinese investment so far. Uh, Costco Pacific has purchased 65% uh, of this and they are investing every year to improve the capabilities. 
But two more uh, reports are in the pipeline. They were also mentioned by President Erdogan when he was in Beijing last year for the Belt and Road International Forum. One is Chandarlı near Izmir. This is right across the sea uh, from Piraeus port in Athens uh, and the port of Mersin uh, and the port of Zonguldak. And well, uh, it appears that, and I'm saying this uh, as a result of my talks with both business people, logistics people, and uh, Navy people, like retired admirals to be precise. So uh, the idea here is that Turkish ports can actually complement instead of not substitute, but complement uh, Greek facilities in this part of the world to strengthen the maritime logistics network between Europe and Middle East and Asia. So it's about, again, bringing the pieces uh, together for an entire network uh, in, in Eastern Mediterranean. And I think Mersin will be more and more important when it's time for the reconstruction of Syria because it's very close to the Syrian border. Okay, China is a technology partner for Turkey. So the idea is uh, working with uh, Turkey, working with China, Turkey can actually close its gaps, well, help to close its gaps in infrastructure, but also technology, because Turkey needs to improve its technological capabilities in order to sustain its growth. So can China be a partner here? Uh, so FTI enabling transfer of technology and co-production is preferred here, in including uh, FTI. We see this in uh, energy sector, uh, in addition to projects in solar energy, hydro energy, coal and renewables, which are already ongoing. There's uh, you know increasing momentum in uh, nuclear energy cooperation between Turkey and China. Uh, so this includes the establishment construction of a nuclear plant, but also many different things that are included in the nuclear uh, progress, including the uh, training of uh, Turkish nuclear engineers. But then again, this is all about diversification. Now, Russians are building the first nuclear plant in Turkey and new Turkish nuclear uh, engineers are at the moment being trained in Moscow. The second one uh, will be trained, uh, will be, uh, the second plant will be established by Japan. And uh, now they are uh, laying the foundation of the Turkish Japanese Technical University near Istanbul. And third, it will be ch with China. We have uh, examples from the defense industry. There was this missile defense system tender where Turkey decided to talk to the uh, Chinese party in addition to NATO partners, Americans and Europeans uh, for purchasing for the procurement of a uh, missile defense system. Here the idea was, well, if the Americans and the European are, are Europeans are only giving us the final product but not giving us the technology, well, if the Chinese are offering this, then why not? And telecommunications, well, Huawei, ZTE, very much active in Turkey. And uh, so they are not facing uh, obstacles in Turkey like they do in other parts of the world, in uh, America, in uh, parts of Europe. Uh, and they are also co investing heavily in research and development. Huawei has its uh, large, I think, second largest uh, research and development laboratory outside China in Turkey, in uh, partnership with Istanbul Technical University, and there are like uh, many uh, engineers, uh, Turkish engineers, being trained there. Okay, concluding remarks. So we have this trade deficit and we learned how to live with this deficit. This is not going to uh, close. And actually, trade deficit, fine. Uh, I mean, Turkey is a country suffering from uh, a current account deficit. But trade deficit with China, you know, you really can learn how to live with it. Because one thing, as long as the costs are staying low, uh, it is improving the purchasing power uh, of the Turkish consumer. The second thing is Turkish producers depend uh, very much on imported intermediary products. So we buy the pieces from abroad, then we put them together uh, and sell them uh, to other markets. So then China is a source, so you can live with this. Uh, but given this picture, uh, in order to establish a more balanced economic relationship uh, from China, which will not only employ uh, investment that will not only bring Chinese money into Turkey, but also, and more importantly, which will help Turkey to close its gaps in technology, know-how, energy sufficiency, and infrastructure. So the focus is on, you know, drawing more investment uh, from China, and BRI is uh, taken, considered within uh, this picture. 
So there are of course, well, fine, so far so good. Uh, and the Chinese are coming uh, to, the Chinese investment is coming as well. Uh, so far so good, but of course there are also, I mean, the nobody, nothing is perfect. Uh, so this relationship is also far from being perfect. Uh, there are uh, some issues. Well, to start with, there are serious differences in on the Uyghur issue. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this, Uyghurs are the uh, ethnic Muslim uh, Turkic uh, minority living in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And of course, there's a huge uh, diaspora elsewhere in the world. Uh, so Tur uh, China is concerned about the activities of uh, the so-called East Eastern Turkestan. Um, I don't remember the name, but an organization uh, with separatist uh, tendencies. And uh, this is uh, undermining the mutual confidence and trust between the two sides. Now, it's not that uh, Turkey is supporting the separatists, but what uh, you have been probably following the detention centers and everything that is going on in uh, Xinjiang region. So this is one thing. And uh, the other thing is, uh, Turkey says, Turkish government says, uh, you know, we want more rights, less oppression, more cultural rights, economic rights, and so on for, uh, for, for, for the Uyghur people. So the thing is, although despite the growing dialogue between the two sides in recent years, there are always question marks in people's uh, minds. The Chinese are thinking they are suspicious whether the Turks are somehow supporting the separatists, the terrorists, and so on. And the Turks are thinking, uh, well, uh, what are they doing in these camps? So are they like banning Ramadan fasting and so on? So uh, I think there needs to be more dialogue between the uh, two uh, governments on this issue. Unfavorable mutual perceptions at the societal level in both in Turkey and China, this is I mean, somehow ongoing. Uh, you go to the street in Turkey, uh, ask people about the Japanese, uh, the Koreans. They say, oh, very good, very nice. But when you say China, probably related to the first item. Uh, so mutual perceptions uh, need to be improved. Similarly in China with respect to Turks. Political instability in the region, uh, which forced the policymakers to divert their energy and attention elsewhere. And okay, we want to do more China, get more investment uh, from China, uh, do technology together with China and so on. But the question that we need to ask ourselves in Turkey, do we have enough institutional capabilities for this? You know, you, you want something, but uh, you know, you need the institutions, you need the human capital uh, and everything. So they need to be improved too. Finally, uh, one concluding, fi my final remark, uh, I always get the question, whenever Turkey gets closer with China, I always get the question whether Turkey is moving away from the West, whether Turkey is breaking away, and uh, whether it is having a shift of access uh, towards, the, uh, towards China, uh, towards the East, away from the West. So, well, if you look at the economy, uh, it's simply impossible for Turkey's economic relations with China or the Asia Pacific in general to reach the level of relations with the West in foreseeable future because Turkey is too much anchored in the West. You have the huge volumes, and if I give you the FDI volumes, I mean 70% of FDI in Turkey is from Europe, just 1% is from China. You have 4 million strong Turkish diaspora in Europe who have business links with Turkey. And well, you have geography, proximity, and so on with uh, Europe. So, uh, so what Turkey is trying to do is diversify, not to put all the eggs in the same basket, in the Western basket, but to diversify so that when you have problem with one basket, not everything gets broken. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Atli, for this uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation that emphasizes the importance of engaging PRI in long-term investment rather than uh, short-term financial flows. I think it's now uh, time to hear from our third speaker, um, Professor Hu Bingbing, who is the Qatar Chair Professor in the Middle Eastern Studies at Peking University, and his, his presentation is on China, Iran, and the Middle East. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and also special thanks for uh, Ensign to invite me for this conference. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to visit Singapore. 
So first, I want to talk about uh, how to understand the Middle East. There are some new features of the Middle East, or we can call a new Middle East is emerging. Uh, so, I mean, there are three main camps now in the region. There's a very clear Shia camp with Iran as a core country. There is a pro-Muslim Brotherhood camp. Uh, we can uh, see the role of Turkey and Qatar. And also there is a third camp uh, consisting of Israel, Saudi Arabia, and UAE. Uh, it defines itself as an anti-Iran uh, and anti-Muslim Brotherhood uh, camp. And there are four uh, main competitions. We can uh, call it uh, strategic competitions in the region. First, there is a Turkey-Iran competition over the leadership in the Islamic world. It's non-confrontational. Uh, uh, the two parties understand they should limit this uh, competition only in Syria. So they keep high-level uh, visit exchange. They keep the uh, trade uh, relationship. They have all the cooperation. Now even in Syria, they have some kind of cooperation. And the second competition is between Iran and Saudi Arabia in the Gulf region. It's comprehensive and confrontational, including different dimensions like domestic political system, like foreign policy, uh, regional security, uh, social, uh, uh, cultural, uh, religious, and also uh, economy and technology. So it's not sectarian. M many people claim that this kind of Saudi Iran uh, tensions is a sectarianism, but it's not true. As I said, it's a comprehensive, confrontational, strategic competition. The third one is the pro Muslim Brotherhood camp and the anti Muslim Brotherhood camp. We can see the tensions between Turkey and Egypt. We can see two years ago the Qatar crisis. It reflects, to some extent, this kind of uh, contradiction between the two camps. And the last one is an uh, inter Arab competition. The most uh, important one is the competition between UAE and Saudi Arabia. So I was in UAE for the last two years and to, for the uh, Abu Dhabi strategic debate. So I saw different voices. Two years ago, the UAE people claimed there is a Saudi-UAE axis in the Arab world. But last year, it has changed to be the core role of UAE alone. So it's very clear UAE has some ambitions in the region, especially in the Horn of Africa and East Africa. So, I mean, uh, besides the traditional regional powers like uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, Israel, we can see the emerging role of rising powers uh, like Qatar and UAE. So I think this is a new situation we have to face. So to deal with this situation, I think China and U.S. have different approaches. First, U.S. want to have alliance with the countries in the region, but China only want to have partnership. And I think U.S. has taken side with some parties in the region, but China want to have balanced relationship with everyone. China has a no enemy or all friend approach in this region. And then US policy in the region has very strong military and security dimension, but China more focus on the economic dimension. So I think for China, uh, the presidential visit to the region in 2016 was extremely important. During that time, China and Iran, Saudi Arabia and Egypt has either established or strengthened the comprehensive strategic partnership. And last year in May, Chinese president made a visit to UAE and also the two countries agreed to have comprehensive strategic partnership. And then just last month, the Emir of Qatar, uh, Sheikh Tamim, made a visit to China and also the two parties decided to strengthen the relationship. And there are two, there are two documents are very important I want to mention uh, related to Chinese policy to the region. First is China's first Arab policy paper, which was released in January 2016. And then the keynote speech made by President Xi during his visit to the headquarters of Arab League. Although there's no clear uh, Chinese strategy or any document has mentioned that, but still we can find some elements of this Chinese uh, policy toward the region. First is China support a, co a cooperation with uh, great powers outside the region in the region. Like China had have some kind of uh, dialogues with the U.S. in the framework of China-U.S. strategic dialogue, but it has stopped. Uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pity. And China doesn't take side, as I mentioned. So it's very clear during the uh, crisis between Iran and Saudi Arabia three years ago, and also Qatar crisis two years ago. Uh, China support a kind of uh, regional uh, secu uh, security and economic cooperation mechanism 
because the lack of this kind of mechanism makes you know the uh, uh, the problems even more serious. But even the people want to talk; they don't find a place to sit down and to talk to together. And then I think China always uh, insists in the political principles like the uh, respect of sovereignty, territorial integrity, non-intervention, especially non-military intervention, and to have a political and diplomatic solution of the problems. And China focuses on economic cooperation, and there is a more and more security and military cooperation with the region. Uh, in regard of BRI, I think especially for GCC countries, there is always a concern that uh, China has bypassed the GCC countries because you know it, it's in the end of any physical uh, network of transportation. It's not you know I mean a corridor between east and west. And also, GCC countries are worried that China take Iran as a main partner in the region and uh, support Iran because Iran can be a partner for you uh, for China against the U.S. I think it's a over exaggerating of all this because China, as I said, uh, prefer partnership. So BRI could be understood as a network of partnerships with other the countries in the region or the international organization, organizations in the region, and also is a network of projects. So as long as BRI is not a physical road network, so it, as long as there is a, a project uh, uh, acceptable for both sides, I think China would have close cooperations with the countries in the region. So currently, we can see some industrial park or industrial zone projects between China and the countries in the Middle East. First, we can see the Suez Canal development zone, and then we have the Dugum uh, uh, zone, and also Khalif Harbor in Abu Dhabi, and also Jizan Industrial City in Saudi Arabia. And also Kuwait has also suggested a kind of five islands uh, projects and also six city projects to China. So it seems that you know China have China has a lot of projects you know in the framework of BI with GCC countries. Very clear. And then I want to talk about Iran. It's very clear that for President Trump, Iran has become the center of his policy in the Middle East. So there are two tracks, I think. First is U.S. is targeting Iran itself, and then U.S. is trying to push back Iran in the region. So to target Iran, we can see the sanctions on the oil sector of Iran and also on this financial uh, payment arrangement. And I think for Iranian side, they regard or they regard the uh, Trump administration's policy as a kind of economic war or a kind of psychological war. So I think for the Iranians, they res respond in this way that there is no solution of this huge pressure, economic pressure on Iranian economy. But this pressure cannot make Iranian economy collapse, and Iranian efforts would make this uh, economic problem. Is not transferred to kind of social crisis. So I think for the Iranians, you know, uh, September, October in last year was the most uh, difficult time. The currency exchange rate and also the pressure of uh, in, uh, inflation, everything was in the peak. But after the uh, in, uh, sanctions have been imposed in uh, early uh, November, I think the psychological impact has going down. So now I think the currency exchange rate is stable. Uh, one U.S. dollar for at about 110,000 uh, riyal, something like that, and the Iranian uh, uh, economy, you know, is is still you know survive. And also, I think for the the uh, Iranian support of their regional partners, uh, it's very clear that uh, the whole expenditure for the Iranians to support their partners in the region is only about five percent of their GDP. So it means that the U.S. pressure uh, on the Iranian economy will not uh, influence Iranian support of their regional partners. And also, I think for Iranians, they have began to design some kind of strategic framework to face the U.S. pressure. Like you know, they began to use the term West Asia instead of Middle East because Middle East is a uh, independent region. You know, there there are no need for any integration with the other part. But as a part of West Asia. There is an intention to have an Asian integration, to make Iran more linked with East Asia and uh, North Asia, like China, Russia, uh, India, and the other Asian countries. So this new approach, you know, would influence Iranian foreign policy and long-term strategy in uh, to to a large extent. For uh, the uh, actually, you know, Iran is not always a key problem between China and U.S., but U.S. always brought Iran. 
to these bilateral relations to have in pressure uh, to have pressure on China. So because of the sanction, China has reduced its import of oil from Iran, and also Kunlun Bank uh, stopped, you know, for a period of time of their uh, processing of transactions between China and Iran. So to find a new uh, payment channel or to think about to use the Europeans, you know, is an uh, alternative one. Uh, if China cannot continue to buy the Iranian oil, if the payment is always in difficulty, we cannot believe that the PRI cooperation between China and Iran would be successful. So there are a lot of challenges. Uh, and Iranians always mention one case, uh, Chabahar Harbor issue. Actually, they want to link Chabahar because Chabahar has got uh, exemption from the US side. Uh, Indians, uh, Japanese have been deeply involved in that. So Iranians come to China to see whether China can also have a deep involvement in Chabahar development project and also link Chabahar with Qadar in Pakistan. So I don't think it's uh, on the priority of Chinese uh, projects of BRI. And China too now uh, has not uh, involved in the Chabahar Harbor development projects because for Chabahar is more like a corridor uh, for Central Asian countries and Pakistan to the Indian Ocean. It's uh, not a part of, you know, Chinese uh, relationship with this region. And for Qatar, uh, I think it's very clear that two years ago, because of this uh, Chinese not taking side position, uh, we didn't uh, involved in this Qatar crisis. Uh, and Qatar, you know, has faced big difficulties in the first month of this crisis, like they have to find out alternative of the supplier of the commodities and also the alternative of transportation routes. And also there's a decreasing of foreign investment, especially from KSA and UAE. And also the exchange rate of the currency has changed also great. But I think after paying uh, uh, not a uh, low price, Qatar has stabilized its economy. Uh, as I said, uh, last month, uh, Qatar uh, Emir Sheikh Tamim has made a visit to China and two parties agreed to have cooperation on PRI in four main fields. First is energy, uh, in especially LNG. Uh, in 2008, China and Qatar have signed a contract to import Qatar LNG in the amount of 5 million tons a year. And then in uh, September 2000, uh, 2018, CNPC signed another contract with Qatar Gas to import another uh, 3.4 million tons of LNG uh, every year for an, uh, for 22 years. So LNG is always you know, a key uh, uh, resource of uh, revenue for Qatar. So Ch Qatar wants to have a long-term strategic partnership with China as a main supplier and a main uh, customer. The second field is uh, the infrastructure. Chinese companies uh, have been involved in the Doha Harbor and also the main stadium of FIFA 2022, and certainly other projects. The third field is investment. Uh, there are branches of Chinese banks, Bank of China, ICBC uh, in Doha, and also there are two uh, Qatar banks have branches in Shanghai. One is uh, QNB, another one is Doha Bank. And also, uh, four years ago, China and Qatar have signed some agreement to have a joint investment fund uh, with the value of uh, 10 billion US dollars. And Qatar's really want to have more cooperation with China in this regard. And the last few days, high technology. After the Qatar crisis, Qatar really th began to think seriously about to have a process of industrialization, especially based on uh, high technology and also on this knowledge, uh, to, to establish a knowledge-based uh, economy. So in this regard, I think we have to mention this Alipay and also WeChat, all this uh, um, uh, payment mechanism have been used in, in Qatar. Uh, you can find this in the duty-free in the Qatar Doha airport. And also beyond that, I think the measures by uh, waiving the, uh, the visa for both countries have given a good opportunity for Qatar to attract Chinese tourists to Qatar. They want to show, you know, Qatar is different from UAE, from Dubai, from the other GCC countries that you can uh, have, you know, your uh, special uh, interest in, uh, in, in Dubai and in, 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 in Doha. And also, I think there uh, are talks about counterterrorism cooperations between China and Qatar. Certainly, I think, you know, I mean, many uh, uh, professors and scholars have mentioned Chinese cooperation with Saudi Arabia and UAE. We can find the similar procedures between China and uh, UAE. So I think there's a challenge that the GCC countries, especially Qatar, UAE, Kuwait, to some extent, even Oman, 
try to have the same development strategy. So if there are similar things, you know, how China deal with all this demand and then how China balance our relations with the different countries, I think this would be a challenge for a long, long run. Thank you very much. A huge thank you to Professor Wu Bingbing. I will now open the floor for questions. Please identify yourself, your name and affiliation, and please keep your question short and brief. OK. Uh, <clears throat> I have two questions. Uh, first, I, I'm from Peking University, called Beijing University. Uh, my name is Wang Suo Lao. Uh, I have two questions. First, uh, uh, given to my colleague from Saudi Arabia, uh, Mr. Mutlak. Uh, second question uh, given to my colleague from Turkey, Dr. Akda Ali. Well, my first question, you know, uh, uh, you give a very informative and detailed uh, uh, speech. I much like it, interesting. But the problem is now in China, just as my colleague Wu Binbin already mentioned that, since you know, uh, recent years, the negotiation between China and the GCC free zone discussion stopped, especially after since one and a half years ago, the crisis between uh, four countries and uh, Qatar. Now in China, we look at GCC, it's a divided uh, block. We separately have a different po policy to different GCC country. So, uh, just in you know, general speaking, when GCC is say, it's not so meaningful for China. Currently, we'll, so my question is, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia is a, friend, is a very uh, a rich country, not only crude oil, but also natural gas. But for a long time, I don't know why Saudi Arabia refused to join gas exporting forum. So maybe even UAE, already joined. Maybe just because the, the headquarter in Qatar? I don't know. Maybe you can give the answer. My second question to uh, my colleague from Turkey. You mentioned that China is an economic power. Actually, this is a common consensus. Recent years, I met so many Turkish students, Turkish professors, Turkish officials in Beijing, even in Turkey. They all think China as economic power, but nobody, a few people think China is a global power. So the, the, pro the pro problem is here. At the same time, uh, Turkey want China to invest and to hope to join one by one road, even Turkey uh, you know, uh, give its own corridor plan. But at the same time, Turkish government recently, uh, you know, uh, frequently, you know, uh, for in Chinese side, Chinese eye created some problem you know, yesterday your foreign ministry, give remarks. So from Chinese side, we think, if you want to hope our invest so much money to help you and to give you a lot of things, you at least you res respect China's interest in the Middle East. So my, you know, the different, you know, uh, you know uh, perception from your side, from our side, maybe this is the gap, is a problem for the cooperation of the two countries. So my question is, how Turkish people look at China as a political power in the Middle East. Thanks. OK, thank you. I think I can answer the question simply in two parts. First part, uh, I really never worked in government in Saudi or outside Saudi. I'm a private sector guy all my life. Uh, I agree uh, this, the division in the Middle East and the GCC doesn't help with the negotiation with China. We business people in all the GCC countries have been lobbying for many times to have not only with China, but with the EU. The EU is the same situation. So, but, you know, what can I say? There's, there's nothing we business can do to influence government other than lobbying. So that's the answer to that. The gas, we've, in the chemical industry, in, in the GCC, have, actually we have a committee called GBCA, Gulf Petrochemical and Chemical uh, Association. We have done studies many years, 30 years, the added value of gas to the economy. For each dollar we spend on the gas, we add $8 to the economy. 
Therefore, the answer is simply, why export something that you can utilize at home and add eight dollars? So export it, you get one dollar. You convert it to something else, the multiplier in the economy is eight. So, we frankly, have no incentive to export whatsoever. Saudi Arabia, for sure, will not gonna export unless it becomes so much swimming in gas or something. Qatar has a different case. Because only gas, and Qatar is a small, you know, what, what 200,000 people, something, you know, you cannot, you cannot do, I mean the locals, I'm not talking about the expat in the country. So, yeah, certain places they can if you have so much surplus, but in the rest of the GCC, like the UAE or Saudi Arabia, we add huge value to our gas. So why throw gold over the fence to the neighbors? Keep your gold in your house. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, okay. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, well, uh, in my last slide, when I said uh, that one of the challenges that we are facing in all of this is that uh, you know unfavorable uh, perceptions between Turks and the Chinese, like uh, Turks not really knowing much about China, and the other way around, of course, and therefore uh, this leading uh, to. Uh, misunderstandings, misperceptions, uh, unfavorable uh, perceptions, and so on. Now, if you ask me what the, Chi what the Turks uh, will think about China as a uh, power uh, in the Middle East, I will say that, you know, many of the people will ask what the Chinese are doing in the Middle East in the first place. So, uh, not really much uh, knowledge uh, about uh, China's global uh, role. Well, one thing, China is a big economic power, as you just said. As you said that, uh, you know, I uh, mentioned uh, this. Well, this is, of course, agreed by everybody. But if you go beyond that, uh, you know, this lack of knowledge, lack of the flow of knowledge between the two peoples is creating all kinds of perceptions. And because we have this Uyghur issue, because there is this uh, Turkish uh, uh, Muslim minority, this makes the whole thing, the whole relationship, more vulnerable to this kind of, uh, you know, misperceptions. So let me give you. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely sure you know it, but for the rest uh, of the uh, audience, let me give you the example uh, of what happened in 2015, in the summer of 2015. So uh, in 2015, suddenly, somehow. Uh, news began to circulate in Turkish media, especially in so Turkish you know, social media, that the Chinese are, uh, the Chinese government is, uh, you know, oppressing the Muslims, oppressing the Uyghurs, and now it came to the stage that they are banning uh, Muslim practice, banning Ramadan fasting, banning uh, prayer in the mosque, even going to mosque. Then it went on, uh, photos began to circulate showing uh, Chinese soldiers brutally uh, you know, beating and uh, torturing uh, Muslims and so on. They were fake, of course. I mean, uh, there is probably something uh, there, like, uh, you know, limitations to uh, fasting uh, in uh, civil offices, in public offices and so on, but it snowballed into something which was very big and which was untrue. Now, and this led to demonstrations in Turkey, anti-Chinese demonstrations in Turkey, which went out of control. Uh, demonstrations against Chinese missions, yes, of course, this is the first target, uh, understandably, but uh, also it went on like, uh, it went ugly, uh, it went ugly, and it only stopped, and this happened right before Erdogan's travel to uh, Beijing. So, Coincidence? Maybe. I don't know. I'm not going to into conspiracy theories, but uh, right before he went to Beijing to talk about BRI and all these uh, things to, with uh, President Xi, these things happened. Uh, and it was only stopped uh, when uh, he himself appeared on TV and he said, I'm paraphrasing, don't believe in everything that you see on TV. So this is the work of uh, those who want to ruin our relations with China. What you have seen there is not true. And it, of course, it was really not true, actually. Uh, all those were fabricated. Now, but the question is, why do people believe in these things? Why is it so easy for uh, us to believe in these things? And this here is, again, the lack of uh, knowledge, lack of information. I mean, uh, this is not only our fault, but this is also your fault. 
This is a mutual fault. So we have to explain each other, explain each other's concerns, not only at the government level, but at the society level, much better to us. So the other day, I had a meeting with uh, some Chinese counterparts, and they were planning some events, public relations, and so on. And I said, OK, you will be coming here, and we will again see uh, all the same things that we have been seeing, like uh, explaining China, in the name of explaining China. Like, we will have calligraphy, we will have tea tasting, which are very nice. I totally respect this. But tell us about the new China. Tell us about the BRI. Tell us about, uh, I don't know, what the Chinese youth are doing. Let us know the Chinese, the Chinese mindset better. Because when people don't know, they can believe in, uh, in, in, in things. So uh, this is something that needs to be worked on, that needs to be improved. The mutual understanding between the peoples. Because I think at the government level, I'm not representing the government, but I think at the government level, despite this interesting announcement uh, two days ago, uh, which might also be very much related to domestic politics because elections are coming in Turkey. Uh, so I think there's better dialogue at the government level. What is more important is the society level. Let the Turks know more about China and let the Chinese know more about the Turks. Thank you very much. My name is Shikata, Japan Forum on International Relations. Let me ask Mr. Mutlaku about Saudi Arabia. Sure. My ba original background is also petrochemical business, so I'm very glad to listen to your presentation. Thank you. I understand that China is going to link its own BRI with Saudi uh, Vision 2030. And one of the key of Vision 2030 was IPO of Saudi Aramco, but it seems to be suspended. So will you tell me if Saudi Arabia has an idea to implement IPO in the near future? And if that's the case, what kind of role do you expect China to play? And if not, how is Saudi is going to secure enough resources for Vision 23? That's the first question. The second question is about petrochemical industries. I understand Saudi Arabia is one of the largest petrochemical industries. And many of them have joint ventures with Japan, US, EU, and so on. So if you're going to introduce new petrochemical industries with other countries such as China, how are you going to coordinate such new enterprises with each other? Or are you going to let them compete on a laissez fair basis? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, the first one, I honestly cannot comment as much because I am not part of Aramco, never worked in Aramco in my life. I don't speak on behalf of the government. So I have no clue. The only clue I know as I get in the Saudi media as anybody can get about the listing being delayed or postponed. But at least the official story we hear in the media has been delayed but will be done. But I honestly have no clue. So it's not my area uh, of, of knowledge or frankly interest. The only oil where I worked, I was working Shell in Houston, Texas in a refinery as a chief engineer. But that was way back in the 80s, so no clue. But we chemicals, I can talk. <laughs> Uh, which we are downstream of the oil, of course. They are our supplier. Sometimes we love them, sometimes we hate them. So it depends where the price is going. So for the Bitchem, as you said, all the JVs are really negotiated with private companies. The only set from the state in Saudi Arabia is the gas price or the feedstock, propane, butane, light, naphtha. That's a government state price that gives to everybody, Chinese or Japanese or American or whoever. So. The negotiation becomes between the Sabix of the world, my company, Tasnir of the world, where we have JVs with Lyondale, Dow, Ivonex, and you know, all kinds. And it's done in market basis. If you can you know, offer the best things with the Saudi companies, or you can do it alone. <laughs> Some companies actually in a market is open, do it alone. So it's not, the price set is not dedicated only for Saudi, but any also foreign company can enter and play the game. So it's, it's not restrictive, so it's, it's no competition. Uh, but there is technically competition in the product. When we make the product and sell it, then we compete. Like I compete with Sabic, my old ex-company, 
And of course, being a mid-size, I don't compete with a big gorilla in the game, otherwise I get crushed. So I try to avoid the elephants in the room and so on with the other companies. But the price is, you know, in the market set and you open, you know, Chinese or whoever can do whatever the game. And Chinese are now doing a project in Jizan, to my knowledge, in, in chemicals actually, downstream in chemicals. So it's, they're already entering in the market. Questions? Hey, Professor Big, big, please. Um, the figures I read is that uh, uh, China's uh, uh, purchase of Iranian oil was, is down around 20% and will probably grow. What significance do you attribute to that? And then, Iran is seeking investments of over $100 billion, in fact, closer to $200 billion, in development of its uh, South Pass uh, uh, gas field, etc. Do you think China will consider stepping in? Thank you. I think, uh, as I mentioned, you know, China has reduced our import from uh, import of oil from Iran. Actually, I think this time uh, U.S. has adopted a diff different policy from Obama administration. That during Obama administration, the sanction was there, the waiver was there, but the waiver was to country, not to companies. Uh, but this time, you know, the waiver is to companies that any company only after reducing its import from Iran oil, then they can get this uh, waiver. So I think. Uh, specific Chinese companies are facing uh, big pressures this time. Uh, as a country, China will continue to buy oil from Iran. It's not a business issue. It's not uh, a, a pressure from U.S. I think it's a, a strong signal of Chinese um, independent foreign policy issue. Uh, and then you mentioned this investment. I think Chinese uh, energy companies like CNPC, uh, CNOC, and Sandopec, all of them are very interested in the market of Iran especially the upstream. Uh, so the South Pars is always a, 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 a point of attention of Chinese energy companies. Still, I have to say, because of the US sanctions and also US pressures, uh, it's still unclear how much Chinese companies could be involved in South Pars and also other projects, uh, not only gas, but oil. Uh, yes, I have a question for Mr. Motlak al Mauritian. I very much appreciated your hard-nosed approach to uh, your analyses, which basically um, is thinking on the basis of what works for me as a businessman and for my business, and bracketing off all the political issues. I think we need a lot more of that sort of thinking in terms of whether the BRI can or cannot work in the Middle East, because once you mix in the geostrategic, the political stuff, uh, you lose uh, analytical focus and rigor of logic. So I'm very happy that you've been consistently uh, uh, helping us think along these uh, rigorous business lines. Okay. Now along those lines, um, it was very clear, you said the money is made upstream, not downstream. But on the other hand, you yourself uh, played a major role in bringing Sabic out to Asia. Uh, Sabe accumulated a lot of uh, intellectual property which allowed you to uh, 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 do stuff downstream and feed your products into the uh, supply chains of Asia. Now my question to you is, do you think that is saturated? Do you really think that all the money is made downstream, uh, upstream and value at downstream somehow that has reached a limit? Or uh, can you help us think further uh, on the basis of your kind of logic, whether there are comparative advantages, complementary comparative advantages between a place like Saudi or your company and uh, Chinese or Asian uh, comparative advantages that can be pushed further if uh, the two come together? Thank you. Uh, that's, thank you. A good point. I mean, I'm a private person. I run a private company, 100% publicly traded in the stock market. I, my shareholder didn't give a damn about what happened outside as long as I pay dividend. And the more of dividend, the more they're happier. Otherwise, they'll fire me. So 
you know, we're not into any games or any, uh, you know, road, uh, you know, railroad, BIs, whatever it is. It's, just, it's uh, our business is how we maximize our profit to our shareholders. Simple as that. When you talk about the upstream, downstream, I think as long as the world economies globally growing by three to four percent, there'll always be advantage maintained by the upstream guys. Unfortunately, in the upstream game, you have to enter the multi-billion dollar game. You cannot, for example, enter the commodity chemicals with a cracker without having $10 billion in your pocket. And not too many people around just walk around with $10 billion in their pockets. So it's kind of barrier to entry, we call it in the business. <laughs> it also can work against you sometimes, it's barrier to exit also, because you put that dumb amount of money, you cannot just walk away. And the difference in the downstream is you can actually enter quite cheaply. Because the plastic conversion, like I gave the example of the iPhones, or even the Samsung TVs, every part you see in that place is made by Sabic or Tasnia or somebody. But it's made the resin, because the resin, you can ship in a 20-foot containers easily in Roro ships around the world. But let's say you make now a pipe from the plastic. You're going to ship a pipe. What you're going to ship is air. So you're going to make that pipe wherever the market is. But because it's just logistics. You know, in our industry, logistic cost can be up to 30% of the cost per ton. So when you make toys and the Saudi market and the whole GCC market, technically our population is small. So, but if you're gonna ship toys from the Middle East or the GCC, it takes a lot of space. So you're better off shipping resin and make a toy somewhere else where the market is actually in your advantage. So that's, that's how we look. At the end of the game, like I said, when you go downstream to an iPhone or a Samsung, you need to be in the market. If you go to the upstream, you need to be where the feed stock advantage is. There is not much middle for the chemical companies. They either have it that way or they cannot have it both except while joking about the Americans. The Americans, they have, they can have. Correct, thank you, that's correct. That's a correction I should have said. Yeah, Saudi is entering the downstream game today, but not with the big boys. It's the smaller guys, the mamas and papas and stuff like that, we call them. I mean, I'm joking, say mamas and papas. These are the men of maybe 100 million, but you go to the Sabics of the world, 100 million. When I was CFO of Sabic, the guys in the office knew, if it's less than a billion, don't bother Mutlaq. It's true, if you move 100 billion, you know, when the guy bother at one billion, it becomes the low level guys, you are a manager level, vice president level, not the, the CFO level. So it's, yeah, it's downstream, Saudi is moving now significantly, but it is not with the big boys. It is the smaller, mid-size SMEs kind of guys get taken advantage of the availability of the resin or availability of the chemical, like we manufacture, di not diaper, the super absorbent that goes in the diaper. So somebody go make diapers in Saudi, where we have a lot of kids, <laughs> and do the market, and sell it into Africa or the other, and that's exactly what's happening. And so, yes, it's happening. I'm afraid we're running out of time. We can squeeze in one final question, please. John Alterman from CSS. I have a question for Bing Bing. As I listened to your presentation, it, it struck me that compared to the other two, it was entirely state-focused. You talked about conflicts between states. You talked about relations between states. And, and what I took from uh, Mr. Mareshid and Mr. Alta's presentation was really the importance of the private sector, of sub-state actors, of businesses. I mean, Turkish business drives Turkish policy, not the other way. As, you th as an academic, as you think about Chinese policy toward the BRI, do you think China is in danger of ignoring non-state actors, of ignoring the private sector, of ignoring other forces other than state-owned industri industries and state actors as it thinks about how both economics and conflict and diplomacy will proceed uh, in this region over the next 20 to 30 years. I think for China, it's always a, a challenge uh, to deal with <clears throat> uh, non-state actors. 
uh, not even in the economic uh, field, but also in the security and political field, like uh, I have mentioned, Hezbollah in Lebanon is a part of the government. Uh, there are you know ministers you know who are uh, who belongs to who belong to uh, the uh, Hezbollah, but it's even difficult for us to have contact with those uh, people and to have direct uh, contact with Hezbollah. So it means that even on a political arena, uh, it's difficult for us to deal with them. So how uh, China can be easily to deal with the, the other uh, non-governmental, non-state actors, I think is a long-term uh, challenge. Uh, let's take an example from uh, uh, UAE. There are about, uh, some people say 200,000 or th uh, 300,000 Chinese in UAE. But this presence of huge number of Chinese uh, people there didn't really increase Chinese knowledge on UAE. So although they live in UAE, they do business on different levels, but still, you know, Chinese understanding on UAE is, uh, I think, to a large extent, very limited. So what's, what's the challenge from this? Uh, how China, I mean, from on different levels, could benefit from this, <coughs> could make use of this wealth to increase our capability? I think is is a challenge to the government, a challenge to our academia to think about the channels to do that. I think uh, you mentioned private sector, but I think the U.S. always focus on Chinese SOEs, their operation in in the in the world, like in Middle East or in Africa. So it seems that you know, I mean, uh, even for the economic uh, in the economic field, uh, the SOEs attract more attentions from. Uh, the others uh, instead of the uh, private uh, companies, I think. So it's a comprehensive challenge, I think, now in different uh, dimensions, uh, social, uh, economy, uh, cultural, uh, I think. So uh, you have raised a very important question. That's a question that we should answer and find a way. <laughs> OK, on that note, let's conclude uh, this session. Thank you all for your attention. It's been a long day for everyone. And uh, a bigger thank you, of course, for the speakers. Please join me to uh, give them a big round of applause.